Hello, welcome to the Friday, June 15th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier today took a look at a compromised WordPress site. This is a site that a reader gave us access to after it was compromised. Looks like the attack actually took advantage of the WordPress XML RPC interface and most likely brute forced a password. Once compromised, the attacker essentially turned the WordPress site into a spam site in particular to target Japanese search engines in this particular case. There was also a web shell left behind in order to provide the attacker with future access. In addition, the attacker also installed a malicious plugin that gave the attacker remote access to the system. WordPress remains the top target as far as web applications go. A lot of the attacks that I'm seeing are really just trying to brute force passwords, not necessarily so much going for vulnerabilities. I've also seen a couple cases where they're looking for some of these backdoors that other attackers may have installed in the past. And if you have been looking at crowdfunding sites recently, you probably saw some of these smart padlocks being advertised. These locks promise to be more secure than some of their mechanical counterparts, and they also offer the convenience of being opened via an app. Typically, the price of these locks is around $100, so that's in line with some of the high-end mechanical locks. Some of the initial attacks against these locks focused on essentially poor mechanical construction. This one particular lock was very easily broken by essentially just twisting off the back cover. Now, this vulnerability apparently has been fixed now with a spring-loaded pin that essentially prevents the back cover from turning. But then, of course, there's also the attack surface of the smart part of the lock, or at least what is supposed to be smart, and that's the ability to open the lock via an app. Now, this happens via Bluetooth Low Energy. And as it turns out, the authentication actually just uses an MD5 hash of the MAC address of the lock. The MAC address is not only guessable, but it's also broadcast by the lock to anybody willing to listen. So it would be rather straightforward to come up with a little app that will listen for the lock's MAC address and then open it by sending the MD5 hash of that address. And Cisco's Talos research team made public the existence of a new vulnerability in Microsoft's WIMG API library. This library is responsible for parsing the Windows imaging format. Now, this format is used for disk images, in particular when you're deploying Windows systems. So it's not a very commonly used file format, and there's also no default handler associated with it. So it's not that you could send someone a file like this and they would double click on it. But if an attacker is able to get Windows to actually look at a malicious WIM file, it would be possible to execute arbitrary code as the user who triggered that operation. So overall, it's a little bit tricky to sort of estimate the risk of this particular vulnerability. It is a code execution vulnerability, but actually triggering it is probably rather difficult, which gets us to Microsoft's response. Microsoft does not really consider this sort of a patch worthy vulnerability at this point. Well, it's Friday again, and today I have with me Mark Lucas. He's an SDI student who recently finished a paper about Outlook 365 logging. So, Mark, why don't you introduce yourself? My name is Mark Lucas. I work at a research institution. I've been there for 20 years, Windows system administrator the entire time. I'm now a lead system administrator. Starting in about 2000, I started taking SANS courses and became interested in security. I am a system administrator that specializes in Windows security. 
So back to your paper, the first time I sort of was confronted with this issue of logging sort of in the cloud was where a good friend of mine, they had a compromise, a business email compromise actually, where someone sort of added forward addresses to their email. And well, they had a real hard time figuring out what email was forwarded to the bad guys what actually happened. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, this problem and uh, what you sort of found in your paper? One of the things that we've done for many years with email on campus is watched where the logins were from. And having a small faculty base and knowing very well where the faculty are at any given time we were able to very quickly determine if a login was coming from somewhere it shouldn't. That very much disappeared when we brought Office 365 on campus about three years ago. The logging was non-existent, so we simply struggled and kept digging. Recently, Microsoft started giving us those logs that we needed so badly. With those logs and knowing where our faculty members are, we can again very quickly determine if a login is coming from somewhere it shouldn't and put a stop to it. You talked about forwards in place. Well, we have had that problem. We've largely mitigated that by turning off the ability for end users to put in forwards. Okay, it's an interesting solution there. Uh, are, are your end users happy with that? I would think particularly in a university setting where people sort of expect more leeway there. <laughs> it works out okay because we can put in the forwards for them and those forwards generally don't change. When people forward, they're forwarding to another institution or another email provider and it's a pretty standard thing. We were able to pick up the forwards that were in place so nobody complains too much. Okay, yeah, that uh, that makes some sense. Now, going a little back to sort of business email compromise and such, that's of course a huge threat these days. One thing I noticed uh, when I sort of was playing with it, like what I did is when people sort of received these email messages that uh, essentially tried to fish their email credentials, that I set up some honeypot accounts and gave the attacker the credentials. And uh, I actually had a little bit bad luck there with Gmail in a sense. Well, bad luck from a research point of view because Gmail blocked all these fake login attempts because they came typically like from Nigeria and countries like that. So they outright blocked it. Is there something like this in Office 365 where you can say, hey, we're just not going to accept uh, logins from Nigeria or other countries. Given how our faculty travel, that would probably be a very bad idea for us as uh, our particular institution. I don't know that there is a way to block that in Office 365. However, there is a way to immediately alert on specific IP addresses or specific geographies where if a login comes from that location, it is immediately alerted on. So yeah, that uh, then still gives you that level of security where someone hopefully will notice if a login comes in from a from an off location. Now, does this go to you, the administrator, or does this go to the user, this alert? The alert goes to our security team who are on call 24 by 7. Okay, so that's pretty good then. So you don't have that catch 22 where the alert goes to the email address that was just compromised. No, that would be not very useful. Yeah. Yeah, so how does this apply to some of the other Office 365 products? We talked about email, but uh, you know, if you think about documents and such that you have stored in Office 365, this works globally across all the Office 365 products if someone logs in? It does. Uh, any sign-in is recorded and alerted on, the sign-ins are universal. So once you sign into Office 365 through the web, you're signed in everywhere. The exception there would be is if you were signing in from a workstation with Outlook or signing into OneDrive. However, Windows, once you sign in in Windows, you're signed in across the board on your workstation. So again, you bring your workstation up, you're signed in. So it doesn't really matter if your workstation's compromised and stolen someplace, we would have that geographic location where it is. 
Aside from the actual login, uh, do you have any other granular logging? So you know, from an incident response perspective, like you just mentioned sort of a stolen workstation, you assume someone had access uh, to the Outlook uh, or Office 365 account for a couple of days. Uh, would you be able to see what documents they accessed or uh, do you just know they logged in? You don't really know what they did. Office 365 has very in-depth logging. It depends on how much you turn on. You do have to turn on specifically logging of the end user account. Administrator access and actions are logged by default, at least some of them. We have turned on in our institution logging for various end user actions, logging for forwards being set up, as you said, deleting email. Uh, that covers us as system administrators as well as alerts us should there be a compromise and what was deleted. So those are some of the logging we have turned on. And there's a, a litany of logs you can turn on now in Office 365. So it's really just like in any system, up to the administrator, how much logging they really want and what logs they can deal with in the end. Yes, that's exactly true. The one piece of good news is you don't have to store these logs if you're not interested in going back more than 90 days. Microsoft does that for you. So if you wanted to turn on all logging, as long as you weren't downloading it and keeping it, trying to keep it on premises, you could have tons and tons of logs. That's pretty good. So anything else you're working on these days? Any sort of final words? I am looking forward to my presentation for SANS. I am about uh, a year away from graduation, so I'm quite excited about that and we'll be taking auditing courses next. Yeah, graduating is always something exciting that eventually will hopefully happen. Well, uh, thanks for joining me here. The link to the paper can be found in the show notes. So thanks, Mark, for joining me here. And that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.